Steve Baker, you actually had a real job before becoming a member of parliament. You're a trained engineer. How important is it for MPs to have real jobs? I think it, it's really very important because we need to be able to identify with the world as it is. So I was an aerospace engineer in the Royal Air Force. So I'm a chartered aer aerospace engineer. And then I did an MSc in computer science and worked in um, software startups and big banks and, uh, and uh, regulators. So I like to think that give, gives me quite a broad, broad base of uh, experience to bring to what I do now. An engineer in the RAF. I was, yes. That's how I met my wife. Which is what I'm about to ask you. Was it love at first sight? It actually was, yeah. Tell me. She walked into the officer's mess at RAF um, Leeming. I was only 24. And it absolutely was love at first sight. She's just my type. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to make that, that woman my mine. And um, I remember another night, she, she was in the bar. And I came in on my motorbike, saw her. She happened to see me, she tells me. And I went racing off, put my best suit on and went and tried to chat her up, which succeeded. So um, we've been married 25 years now, but it really was love at first sight. Yeah. I'm dying to ask what your chat up line was. It was a little while ago. I think it was, hi, I'm Steve Baker. I think that's what she'd say if, if she was here, but I'm not sure that would work with everybody these days. Do you have children? We don't know. We never got round to it, but we've got a little horde of godchildren. I've got um, four families where we're godparents and we love them dearly. You went to a comprehensive school. Your first degree wasn't at Oxbridge. No. Are you working class? Well, I hope so. But I have this conversation with my new friend, Professor Paul Dolan at the LSE, who has a lot to say about this. My father retired now, but a carpenter all his life, you know, putting roofs on houses and staircases in. And my mum was an administrative clerk who went on to administer a local charity for disabled children. Um, so I suppose I'm working class. Uh, I did have a year at a prep school on a scholarship. Yeah, I mean, working class family. I mean, my father's side of the family were soldiers, not officers, soldiers. And my mother's side, you know, granddad was a good socialist. I once knocked on a door at a Queen's party. or oh, no, no, it wasn't knocking on a door. I turned up at one of the Queen's Jubilee parties and a man was there, said, you're in the RAF. Did you ever serve at uh, RAE -E Farnborough? I said, no, but my granddad did. What's his name? Stanley Brimble. No, not Stanley Brimble. He taught me to be a good socialist. So thanks, Grandad. That's one, one for your vote. Did you ever contemplate socialism? So I'm, uh, I think my politics slightly uh, confound people because I'm an old liberal. I think I'm an unrepentant old liberal. I almost try to be dogmatically old liberal. There's a lot in the socialist tradition with which I have a great deal of sympathy, like the cooperative and mutual tradition. But I, I've got sympathy with that part of, the, as it were, the, the labour movement. Not because I think the means of production ought to be nationalised, but because I think it's a great and healthy way to organise social cooperation. So, you know, I've, I've got a great deal of sympathy with, with co-ops and mutuals, and I've done quite a lot in 10 years with, with the movement. But I don't believe in state planning of the economy. And to me, I know you guys, you've moved on a bit. The Labour Party's moved on a bit. But in the end, I believe in people cooperating freely, not coercion. Are you a conservative or a radical? Because sometimes you seem quite radical in politics. <laughs> I'm a Christian libertarian. I once said that to Paul Goodman. He said, you'll be the only one. And he was right. So my politics are bleeding heart, libertarian, Christian libertarian, or a classical liberal. Certainly not a Tory, but I would say that I am a conservative because I'm an old English liberal. And that's just one of the tensions in the Conservative Party. In fact, a Labour MP once said to me after a meeting on mutuals that you're an MP without a party. And that's not quite true. I'm proud to be in the party I'm in, but being in the Conservative Party is sometimes uh, quite trying because I say I'm, I'm not a Tory. What's been the most trying bit of being in the Conservative <laughs> Party? Probably getting through the last year, actually. I thought it would be Brexit, but watching so many of my colleagues be enthusiastic for, or apparently enthusiastic for things like vaccine passports or lockdown measures, that's been very, very tough. Boris, after all, was somebody I helped to become Prime Minister. So to see so much of our freedom being curtailed and so abruptly and so forcefully, um, that's been very, very tough to be part of. And because of the nature, the first past the post nature of our electoral system, the parties have to be broad churches. Yeah, I think there's a really strange mapping now between political ideas and political parties. So I think my party is an amalgam of conservatives and classical liberals. In the Labour Party, there's cooperative and mutualist people. There's Blairites, there's perhaps even some Stalinists, but it's a very broad church. And the Liberal Democrats, there's classical liberals, there's social democrats. So all these ideas are all mixed up in every party and we're all muddling along, then trying to be pragma pragmatic on something called the centre ground. But, you know, in the end, I'm sticking with the Conservative Party. I think it's the best hope we've got for free market government, and that's what I'd be looking for.
I'm interested in what happens in your own party since we're, we're talking about this. So in the Labour Party, those ideological tensions, they often flare up. They're very, very difficult. They can get very bitter. So when you profoundly disagree with something, you've cited um, liberty and Lockdown. the lockdowns and all of those things. How do the tensions over big stuff like that, big things like that, how do they play out in the Conservative Party? Slightly huffy behaviour, usually. One or two colleagues will be quite uh, snippy and condemning. But it's not usually furious. And to be honest, I think going through the Brexit process in government and with everything that I did, I think there's an element that my colleagues have learned that there's not a lot that they can say to me that will make much difference if they're just trying to it's effectively bullying me. So I, maybe I get a different perspective on it. But my sense is generally in the Conservative Party, the, the dominant ideology is pragmatism. There can be fierce disagreements, but I've seen it time and again that Tory MPs would rather just come together and muddle forwards. Do you have a best friend in politics? I do have a best friend in politics, but he's not an MP. Do you have close friends that are MPs? Well, Gosh, I don't want to offend any MPs. I would certainly say that I have friends who are MPs, yes, and people who I hold in very high regard. But amongst MPs, there aren't any people who I go on holiday with or have weekends away with. My close friends, the ones I would actually go on holiday with or away at the weekend, they're all ex-Air Force people, quite honestly. The people I trained with when, uh, you know, in, when I went into the Air Force. You turned 50 this year. Don't tell me that. <laughs> I still feel 30, I don't know. Did you have a big party? I wanted a big party. I wanted a big party. I wanted, because it's also my 25th wedding anniversary, so I wanted to do something big in Parliament, get everybody who knows us in. But of course, COVID wrecked our plans. and I didn't feel we could plan ahead. So my birthday was June. So, you know, we could have done something, but I'm afraid the whole lockdown thing just, just um, drained my joy for doing that, I'm afraid. I'll do it when I'm 60, perhaps. Would you invite any MPs? Oh yeah, if I'd done it in Parliament, I should certainly have invited uh, you know, all my MP friends. A lot of politics, as you know, is really hard work and uh, there's not a lot of fun, but friends and family can't quite believe that they're watching, you know, probably little Steve in their mind from 45 years ago, walking up Downing Street and talking to cameras. So for that group of friends and family, it would certainly have been fun to come into Parliament. You were a big figure uh, during the Brexit debate. So I voted Remain but respected the result. And right. actually I lost some friends as a result of that position. Did you lose any friends nearly. over Brexit? Yeah, nearly. Uh, a very dear and old friend was very, very angry with me and very, very angry with the situation. Uh, but we pulled through and he decided to forgive me. Um, but yeah, I nearly lost a friend, but ultimately I didn't, I've not lost any friends. Over Do you have any friends who are in the Labour Party? Um, yes, I have had friends in the Labour Party. I did quite a bit with Michael Meacher, although I didn't go drinking with him, but I, oddly I quite often agreed with him on money and banking. But one or two other people, so one or two of the characters around the Tiggers, I was close to at the time and my advice was asked. Um, I think that Tiggers were rather blown up by the European Parliament elections, which was a pity, but I couldn't say I'm close to people in the Labour Party, but I'm certainly on civilised terms with plenty of Labour MPs, yeah. I don't want to be on bad terms with anybody, that's the crucial <laughs> thing. Well, some people might say you would be on bad terms with the government whips. Because... Do you know, even that, that some of my best friends are in the whips office. <laughs> really? Mark Spencer. I'm a, a huge fan of Mark Spencer. We get on tremendously well. We often agree on matters. Doesn't matter which ones. The thing about the whips office is to treat it more like a boxing match or a judo match or a football match or something where it's full force and sport on the field. But afterwards, you, you just got to get on with each other. They must say some fruity things in the whips office when you're not in there. <laughs> I bet they do, yes. <laughs> but I've been known to take them a bottle of whiskey to say sorry for, a, I don't know, starting a revolution on the weekend and not telling them in advance or whatever it was. Didn't they forgive you for the, if you give them the chocolates and the whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think they always find it difficult to bear a grudge with me. But, you know, I think we all recognise that we're a team. I think the thing with me when I rebel, or indeed organise rebellions, is that everybody knows I'm doing it because I mean it. I'm not doing it just to be difficult. I'm doing it because I believe in a thing. So uh, I think that leads to a degree of forgiveness. Would you like to be a government minister again? I'm not really bothered, if I'm honest. As an individual thinking about myself and a career, if I'm allowed, 
you know, obviously there's, there's not really anywhere to go unless you're a minister, you know, serving the public, fantastic privilege and, and what a joy and sometimes sorrow it is to be involved in the lives of about 75,000 electors and, and more besides. But in terms of personal development, there isn't anywhere to go without being a minister. So, um, yes, I would like to be a minister again, but it doesn't seem very likely at the moment. I've rebelled too much. Were those rebellions a price worth paying? Yes, because they were always about integrity and what I thought was right. Uh, and that's, I think, the trouble that I have and that the party perhaps has with me is that um, I have got a, 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 an unnerving tendency to do what I think is right. Uh, but I, I do compromise. You know, I compromised in the end to have a Brexit deal. And I compromise every single day to just vote with the party on, on different issues. Now, I resigned from government on principle. I then declined to join the government on principle. And, you know, they, they're only going to waste their time so often with somebody who might walk or might not join. So, honestly, I'm quite happy standing up for things. I don't know if you are. I think you would like to be... A government minister listening to what you've said? Well, people tell me that I was quite a good government minister. I mean, I did get the EU Withdrawal Act through Parliament in minority. And I think one of the reasons I was appointed was so that a Brexiteer had failed. And I didn't. I succeeded. And it was hard. Um, I was also responsible for all the domestic prep, prep for leaving the EU. You'll remember that was given to Michael Gove. That was why, of course, I didn't join the department, because Boris had stripped everything out. But, you know, as a parliamentary undersecretary, I ended up chairing meetings of an interministerial group, details of which are not important. But what does matter is people before that group were secretaries of state, and I was in the chair as a parliamentary undersecretary on the lowest rung. And every one of those meetings I chaired, I chaired to a satisfactory conclusion. So if you ask me, can I do it? Can I operate as a senior minister across all of government? Yes, definitely, because I have done, and it was a success. Can I get legislation through parliament? Yes. Can I do an urgent question under extreme pressure? Yes. Can you be loyal? Well, I can be loyal, yeah, but equally the trouble is it's, look, but I'd rather be loyal to ideas than mere loyalty. I want to be loyal, I do, I want to be loyal, but mere, mere loyalty when the wrong thing is being done is very, very hard. But that's probably why I'm on the back benches. Your seat had a fairly significant swing away from the Tories, not because of you, but because of the demographics. Well, what, 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 how does the Tory party rebuild its connection with traditional Tory voters, which is the seat that, that you represent. What's happening in seats like that? Well, Wickham is actually very unusual. It's been Conservative for a long time. But if you look at the number of votes cast in each election, what's happened is that uh, since 2001, the number of votes cast has increased each year, except in the last election, mm -hmm. where I lost 2,000 angry Conservatives to the Liberal Democrats. And fair enough, you know, I had been a big prominent figure. The district, which is bigger, voted Remain. So I lost 2,000 votes. But the big story in Wickham is the Labour Party is a big bathtub. And the Labour Party surged back. So there are particular local demographic issues going on in Wickham, which narrow the, the majority if uh, the Labour Party choose the right candidate. And that, that's really what's going on. Um, but I never take anyone's vote for granted. And certainly through Brexit, people were very angry with me. And I would like to try and heal those uh, wounds. But, What's going on in Wickham is very specific to Wickham, I think. Chesham and Amersham was the public very much ready for a rebellion, uh, a protest perhaps. Um, but, you know, I think I can win Wickham again uh, and keep winning Wickham, but not by any kind of complacency. I should be working hard. You mentioned your Christianity. I was reading uh, in a profile of you, it describes you as a committed evangelical Christian. If that is an accurate description, what does it mean in practice? I don't normally describe myself as an evangelical. I would normally say I'm a mere Christian in the style of C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. But um, my Christianity is about everything that I believe. So on the one hand, I'd reassure anybody that I don't think law should be set according to faith. If something's faith, you can't use it to coerce other people. So the law must be set on the basis of evidence, and reason uh, and um, secular factors. But in the end, I believe the big story of the Bible is that God creates the world, gives the people the law, gives the prophets to tell the people to keep turning back to the law, and they keep failing. Even after they followed God out of slavery through the desert, they pour gold into a calf and worship that instead, when they've only just been given the Ten Commandments, tell them not to as the top two commandments. People are not good at following rules. The big story of the Bible is that society is not going to be fixed by setting law. And then what happens in the Bible, Jesus comes and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. He fulfills the law, he saves us by grace. That to me is consistent with my classical liberalism. In the course of my journey into politics, I found myself in the chapels of Salamanca, 
where Thomist scholastics wrote the first systematic treatises on society and politics and economics. And of course, they were classical liberal treatises. The idea was freedom. Freedom under the rule of law, but freedom. And I think that Christianity has lost this idea and politics has lost this idea that it is possible to have a consistent and moral whole idea of how society should work. And I'm afraid it does require some things that we don't like talking about in politics, like virtue. People need to be responsible. They need to have faith, hope, love. Um, and, and those things are embodied in, you know, in, in the story of the Bible. And you know, so I've said it before, I'm, I'm, I'm under a command to love even my enemies. And that's hard, but I'm trying. But that's why I'm not on bad terms with anybody. So I suppose we just, just fast forward it to secular situations. We're in a position now, as I've been setting out, where the long-term public finances are unsustainable. The government's budget watchdog keeps finding that. Why? Well, since the 1911 National Insurance Act, we've kept on throwing yet more pledges and pledges onto taxpayers on behalf of everybody else, which would be fine perhaps if it was a savings scheme with investments, but it's not, it's a Ponzi scheme where you pay as you go. So now that our demographics are not a pyramid, we're ending up that we, we, in the future, we're not going to be able to afford the welfare state promises we made unless we do something serious. Now, I, I think that's quite important and I'm willing to be perhaps brave and say to people, we need to think about how we can live differently. And that living differently has got to be centered on loving one another. And so, forgive me, that's a bit of a long expedition, but that's how, to me, Christianity and politics are related in society. That was very, um, very passionate. Is your Christianity a bigger part of you than your conservatism or liberalism or however you describe yourself? Well, yeah, of course. I think if you're a Christian, and I've been a Christian for a long time, imperfect as I am, uh, it's the most important thing because it's eternal. You still have to be able to separate what you believe as a faith from what you do in a secular context. But nothing, if, 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 I think once you've been a Christian for a, a long time, uh, nothing can be more important, really. How does Steve Baker relax? Skydiving, motorcycling, trail running. I used to have a, a fast cash run. I'm afraid I'm not very good at slowing down. So skydiving is fantastic. If once you're in free fall, you think of nothing else but being in free fall. So. Like Does your wife worry about you doing those things? <laughs> oh, she doesn't actually. She actually encourages me to go. She knows that <laughs> I come back happy and relaxed. Do you drink? Uh, no, no. I mean, only socially and a bit, not a lot. No. Do I drink? Yes, yes, no. <laughs> I mean, when I was in my twenties uh, in the air force, I drank too much for a while, but realised and stopped it. Do you think you'll be an MP forever? Hopefully not forever. I would like to enjoy my retirement one day, uh, but I don't know. You know, I've, I've often said I'm in politics for a long time, not a nice time. So we'll. We'll take a decision on that one day. Steve Baker, thank you for sharing the real you with me. It's been absolutely fascinating. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.